am a brave, I'll just get rid of the recording thing that popped up in my screen. So we'll try that again. So I am Melissa and I am a brave feminine leader. Uh, I'm a mum to two wonderful teenagers. I've got a 16 year old daughter, Sky, and a almost 14 year old son, Sebastian. I'm an incredible wife most of the time and I'm a loving daughter. Um, I am deeply curious about great leadership and I'm deeply curious about why progress has stalled for women. Um, my passion stems from my time as CEO. And in that time, I led an organization of over four and a half thousand employees. And it, it really was a kind of pivotal moment in terms of realizing the impact and potential my voice had as a female CEO and the, and the impact that had um, on other women in the organization. Until that point, it really had not seemed unusual or strange because we're just getting on doing what we do um, and I really noticed it then. I get to focus on my passion every day as co-founder of the Brave Group and my co-founder is sitting in the audience so Kelly people might not be able to see you right now but feel free to give them a wave and as part of that a part of what I do I get to in you know I get to interview incredible leaders through the Brave Feminine Leadership interview series which I think was how Jules and I connected in the first place so I'm at 53 and counting Jules I'm I'm coming up behind you for those 200 and loving it and I balance that time with paid board roles and I emphasise the paid element and we'll we'll touch on boards when we come around a bit later and also executive mentoring and I do all of that because I am, I just believe the world will be a better place when the incredible responsibility and privilege of leadership is equally shared. So when feminine energy can shine as brightly as masculine energy, that's kind of what I'm striving for. And in addition to all of that, I have got one of the best mirror faces you've ever seen. So if you haven't come across the term mirror face before, um, you'll probably see it today. It's an unconscious thing. And as I catch a glimpse of myself in the camera, automatically my cheekbones narrow. Uh, and I, I, I can't pull it if I try, but, you know, uh, my daughter first pointed that out to me and she's 16 now. Jules is making a beautiful mirror face if anyone can see her. Um, it's one of those things about having kids where they kind of ground you. But I do want to say having a 16 year old is not always bad. And I shared this with a colleague this morning that I, I did an interview this morning. So I was kind of glammed up for the interview. And then I rolled on to this conversation with you. So, you know, there's not always this color lipstick on. It's, it's kind of on purpose today. Anyway, my daughter came out to the kitchen. We're sitting there sort of she's making a breakfast. I've just finished the interview. And she said, Mom, you look amazing. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, this is incredible, darling. You know, I'll soak that up. And uh, I said, oh, thank you, sweetheart. And she goes, honestly, mum, and she does tend to be a bit dramatic sometimes, mum, you look like you've stepped out of a commercial for the freshest rainforest water in the Amazon. And I just encourage all of you, we all hear, we all hear the bad about having a teenage daughter. There's some bloody good stuff in there too. So, um, look, I float in here looking looking clearly like I've just, I don't know whether I'm floating down the Amazon or what's going on, but uh, something to do with rainforest and water. So I called our session today, Fears, Tears, and the Magic Appears. And I wanna share with you three things that I kind of know for sure um, throughout every phase of my journey. The first one is we can all do hard shit. And we don't know it sometimes until we're tested, but we really can all do hard shit. The second one is, I should have, I should have um, given a language warning up front. I hope that's okay. It won't get any worse than that. Or I don't think it will anyway. Good, Jules has given me the thumbs up. So um, the second one is, we're all so much more powerful than we realise. And we just, we, we forget that sometimes, but all of us are incredibly powerful. Um, and I'll touch on some of that. And then the last thing, kind of big lesson for me, I think at various stages in my journey is that we don't have to do stuff alone. 
Um, and I think we we struggle along sometimes kind of feeling that we do, but we don't have to. So let me let me start by saying I've always had a thing for seatbelts. So I grew up with a father who was a pilot and he warned me that sometimes completely unexpectedly you'll be traveling in a plane and the plane just drops straight out of the air. And so he always said to me, and I vividly remember this, he always said to me, always keep your seatbelt on when you're on an aeroplane. Has anyone experienced that turbulence? Hands up for me if you've done that. Yeah, I see a lot of nods and hands, right. So his, and I traveled a lot as a kid. I grew up overseas, lived on aeroplanes um, for work, lived on aeroplanes. So a lot of aeroplane travel. I'd never experienced anything like this one time. My husband and I were traveling from Barcelona to London. We're on British Airways. Um, the meal service was underway and we'd been served hot coffee when all of a sudden, bang, like the, literally the plane dropped. And if you've been in that situation, you've seen the trays, the cutlery, you know, everything stays up there, you drop and then it ends up landing on you. And my husband is a nervous flyer anyway. And so I kind of looked across at him and, and peeled his fingers off of the seat, you know, where he was clutching on kind of grabbed his hand and, you know, I said to him at the time, it's okay, darling, like we've, we've had our seatbelts on. And I think at every stage of my life so far, I've kind of looked around for the seatbelt. And sometimes it's taken me a while to find that seatbelt, but I've always kind of looked around for, have I got my seatbelt on? So let's step through and i'll only step you through kind of three phases of my journey there's there's probably plenty but these are probably the ones that might be the most useful for people and i think particularly for people that are coaching and working with with female leaders so i became ceo in 2010 so i stepped into a role i'd been in the company for a long time i was part of the startup uh, leadership team of this wonderful organization uh, I'd navigated um, having a couple of children and the CEO role, um, look, it, it probably wasn't on my radar at the time I was offered that role. I was just back at work after having my second child. I was working part time. I'd kind of juggled everything in between. And the then CEO said to me, here you go, here's this opportunity. And my husband and I took quite some time to think about, did I want to step into that? And I'll be very transparent with this audience because, you know, I think it's important for us to share the reasons we do things and all that sort of stuff. And there, without a doubt in my mind, one of the reasons I said yes was because I thought, oh, my God, who might I have to report to if I say no? Um, so without a doubt, that was one of the reasons that I said it. Um, and, you know, no doubt there was, you know, ego and all sorts of other things going on with accepting the role. But. It, what was important to us was our kids were very young. So, you know, I had a five-year-old and a two-year-old and we needed to think carefully about how we're going to juggle it. And my husband, who is a teacher, said to me one afternoon, um, I really, like, I feel like a break. I think it might be my time to step back. So I kind of chewed on my tongue. Um, you know, I didn't want him to have any inkling that it might not be the break he was looking forward to. Um, but I said, oh, that sounds fantastic, darling. Let's, um, let's go down that path. So we did. So we kind of flipped roles and he came home with the kids and kind of stayed there for the next three or four years to get them off to school and helped us sort of do what we wanted to do. Um, incredibly lucky. I picked a brilliant husband. So for anyone who needs any kind of advice in that area, like pick yourself a brilliant husband. It's hard to know, I think, when you, when you first choose, but I lucked out in that role. So look, I loved that role. And I think um, I think it's really important to talk about it's the best role you can have. And whether people look at it and they think I'm I'm scared of that role or whatever it is, it's an incredible role. I mean, it's it's humbling. The responsibility of it is humbling when you look around and and you can physically feel the kind of weight of that when you step into the role. But the privilege of it, you know, the privilege of being able to create a place where people belong and, you know, we, we did that. We had incredible tenure in our organisation. You know, people talked about it as, as a family um, and the party's broken up now because the company's been sold. So that's been a bit painful watching the sort of breakup of that family. But incredible responsibility. And so I just wanted to kind of share the things that I probably took out of that time more than anything else. And I think the first one is how you show up is absolutely key to your success. 
um, you've really got to get to know yourself and what it takes to be at your best. And people are always watching and they're always listening and they're trying to read and interpret from every facial expression you give off. And I learned that lesson really early in my tenure and I joined a group of guys from IT and we had not invested in IT appropriately for some time and so our performance left some areas to be desired at that point in time. And I sat in a meeting with, with you know, this wonderful team of people and they said, what do you think of IT? And I said, I think we've got an incredible team of passionate people, um, you know, all doing their very best. If I sit in the client's shoes, though, and I look at our performance, I think it's shit. And I left that room thinking I've had a really good, transparent, honest, heartfelt conversation with this team. I've told them that I think they're really good. And our CIO came running into my office and said, what have you said? Like, I've got all of these guys sitting there just thinking you think they're shit. And so I grabbed them all, put them all back in a room. And I said, listen, let, let's talk about what I said. Let's, you know, let's go through this again. And it was the first thing where I thought, I'm going to have to watch how I say things, not just what I'm saying, but kind of how I say things and, and make sure that I've, you know, had people reflect back at me. Yeah, I can see thumbs up and all sorts of things, but, you know, they're, they're, everyone is watching when you step into those roles. So you do need to be prepared for that. It's a, it's a big change. The other thing is, you know, you really get to create the CEO role the way you want to do it. And if you don't set your priorities, everyone else is going to. And one of the things I see, and I have just the absolute privilege of working with incredible leaders, not just all female, but, um, you know, incredible leaders. And one of the things I see people doing a lot is they try and emulate the image of who they think, what they think a good CEO should look like or what, what they think a good founder should look like. Um, you know, and I see founders, you know, it's, it's a hard job. Being a CEO is a hard job. Being a founder is a hard job. I see people working themselves to the absolute bone because their perception is that's what you do. Like that's how you be successful if you do some of that stuff. Um, and, it's, and it's not. That's how you burn out um, is what that is. So, um, you know, there is no perfect CEO and you're there because of who you are. The perfect CEO role doesn't exist. So you're unique. Work out what it needs to look like for you. Um, and then the thing is everyone, when they're in those roles, there is always a key risk that could happen to the company. And, you know, I'm happy to, to share mine. I jumped into this role and we had a massive key client dependency. So 85% of our business was with one, one client. Huge. And we're a big company. That was a lot of eggs in one basket. And um, anyway, they went to tender. They were all contract-based sort of tender sort of things. They went to tender for all of the work. And I would lay awake at night thinking to myself, I'm going to be the CEO that's going to lose all of this. And I really, you know, I lost a lot of sleep over that until I thought, what, what would happen if that happened? So if the worst thing happened, what would that look like? And I actually sat down and developed a plan. And I knew that I'd have to make a lot of people redundant. I knew I'd have to make some really tough decisions and, and do some hard things. But once I made the plan, I also understood that my role as CEO was really about the survival of the organisation long term as well. And so once I understood that I was going to be able to navigate through that regardless, I just got on with the job. And I see people carrying around in their heads often these what if scenarios, what if this happens, what if that happens and things like that. It's kind of just face it, get on with the plan and, um, and keep moving. So, you know, in my time as CEO, I had some really challenging things to do. I had, um, or happen, you know, I had, um, um, despite trying every single thing to, to not end up in this scenario, I had a situation where I had to make 300 people redundant, uh, you know, fly in, fly into Adelaide. Um, and, you know, we can do hard shit. And, you know, I think it's the way you do those things. So, you know, it's and I've got a colleague here who was with me doing that. But, you know, we literally made sure that we spoke to every single person. 
So, um, you know, in, in fairly large groups and we had to move rapidly because you need to make sure that you get through people quickly so news doesn't travel. But, you know, the respect, when we asked people on that day to please respect the fact that their colleagues didn't know this news. So could they show the respect to us and to their colleagues primarily of letting us be the ones communicate that news? And because of the culture we'd built and we did build an extraordinary culture, um, people respected that. And so we got to tell people um, you know, that really sort of very challenging and difficult story. And we looked after people and we, we helped them and we helped them move on to the next phase of their life. So, you know, you do have to do some difficult things. But I also mentioned to you guys that it was while I was in that role that I think for the first time I was aware of the impact of being a female and being a CEO. And, you know, I would have younger people say to me, um, People would always say to me, you're not a normal CEO. And I, it took me a long time to work out what that was. And I think it was because when we talk about that image of CEO, um, you know, often those images are, you know, kind of aloof, distant, uh, professional, you know, insert whatever you want to for whatever image comes to your mind when you think about CEOs that you may have worked with before. Um, and that wasn't ever me. I never took myself too seriously, uh, or I tried not to anyway, um, and was always pretty down to earth. And um, yeah, thank you, human heart centered leadership. I think that was kind of, um, you know, it was kind of the way that I operated in that role. And I just was so taken aback when I had a couple of incredible young, aspiring female executives sit back and say, you know, it is so inspiring to see a female CEO. Um, and that just started a little thread of curiosity for me. And I got to explore that thread of curiosity as I went on later. But the other thing about, you know, not having to do it on your own, um, it's so important for leaders to surround themselves with a network, with mentors, with coaches, with people outside of the business that they can trust. Um, because it is, you know, it is a lonely role. Um, and you do need to make sure that you build yourself a team of people you can trust, that you can bounce, you know, bounce ideas off and, um, and kind of check in. So for me at that point in time, you know, my, my seatbelt was really the culture that we built as an organisation. You know, for me, that was the thing that kind of carried me through. Um, I did want to just mention, because I know the audience here, so I know that there'll be a lot of people focused on, you know, how do, how do people take that step from executive to CEO? How do we need to support them taking that step and things like that? And so I kind of pulled out a couple of things where I see some of the challenges are. I think the first one is when you move into the CEO role, you really are conducting the orchestra. And I come across so many female leaders who find it really hard to stop the doing. You know, their whole careers, they've been um, celebrated and, and rewarded and acknowledged for doing a really good job and being the one that gets stuff done. Um, and you can't be a CEO and do that. Like that really is burnout city. Um, so it's hard for people to do that. And, you know, even in my, I think always as a leader, one of the things that I always said to people who were in my team is I'll support you in any way you need. I'll coach, I'll do all those things, but I won't ever do your job. And I think I see a lot of people trying to do their team's jobs, trying to protect them and trying to carry their workload as well as their own. Um, and it doesn't, it just doesn't set you up appropriately to kind of have the freedom to step up and do what you need to do in that role. The other thing is, you know, you have to be a storyteller and you have to paint a vision. So, you know, if you're working with female leaders, can they paint a compelling vision? Because, you know, you're not a leader if no one wants to follow. So, you know, that's super important. And then can they imagine an experience for everyone and create a company where everyone belongs? And that's, it's so topical today. I mean, everywhere you look, you see the great resignation, the great realignment, the, the great call it whatever you want. Um, I think it's unnecessary. And I think, you know, if leaders stopped right now and engaged with people and said, what do you need? What do you need? How can I help? People, they, they, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So, um, 
I get a bit I get a bit angry when I see those articles, to be honest with you, because I think it's a lot simpler than we make it sometimes. Um, the other thing with female leaders is are they filling themselves up with external thinking, you know, keeping themselves fresh, keeping themselves engaged. Um, and, you know, I learned this recently out of one of my interviews and I thought it was such a fabulous tip. You know, are people deliberately updating their CV every six months? You know, are you really sitting back and looking at what have I done in the last six months and how is it adding to, you know, my growth and my development and capturing it? You know, I work with a lot of people who haven't applied for a job for a long time. They don't have an up-to-date CV. And when they try and write it, trying to remember back to all the things that you've done is, is next to impossible. So I think that's a great discipline for everyone. Um, I already said leadership is an inner game and it really is an inner game. And I think one of the key things is around managing your energy, which kind of takes me to the next phase and stage for me because um, I did manage my energy until I didn't. So the next phase, and Jules alluded to this before, um, was, was December 2017. Let me take you there. So December 2000, or 2017 had been a hell of a year. So we were um, exploring on behalf of our owners selling the company. Uh, and I think I mentioned that's since been successful, but uh, we were exploring that wasn't our first rodeo. We had tried to sell it before and that hadn't been successful. So there was a fair bit of pressure on this sales process. And I did, um, I did what I don't think I'd ever done in my career before. And I tried to shelter my team from the workload. And, um, and so I carried, um, you know, together with um, the CFO, because it, you really can't shelter a CFO from those processes, but I really carried, um, you know, far too big a load and didn't handle it the way that I think I should have handled it in hindsight um, and did put pressure on my team. Like it's not that they escaped that pressure at all, but I did try to carry a lot of it. Um, and it was exhausting and I was renovating a house at the same time. So there are a few things going on in my life and um, woke up one morning, jumped in the shower and found a lump under my armpit. And I knew enough to know that I needed to go and see my GP. So, you know, it was obvious that it hadn't been there before and it didn't feel like it should be there. And so off I went. So I went and saw my GP and I'm very good at, you know, compartmentalising things. So, you know, it's like, okay, go deal with that. Do what I need to do. Um, don't, don't worry too much about that. Who knows? It could be anything. And so I got to my GP and she kind of had a look and said, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we'll explore it and see where we go. You've earned yourself a mammogram and an ultrasound. And I was 45 at the time and I'd never had those before. I was one of those lucky people that had no history, had no reason to do any of those things. And whenever anyone talks about the thought of a mammogram, all we hear is, you know, let's take a, sorry, Adam, uh, let's take, you know, let's take these boobs, no matter what they look like, feel like or otherwise, and let's squash them flat. And it just, it sounds like so much fun. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's exactly the sort of thing that you want to do in your free time. Um, so I'd never done it before. So off I went and, you know, I went into work on the Monday. It was a somewhat normal day. We had our shareholders, our owners are from the US. Our shareholders were over here. So I met with them and I met with our chairman and we're having a chat about this sales process. And then I had the pleasure, and I'm being sarcastic, of heading off to a client meeting with a client that I really didn't like. Um, I'm super happy to name them. It's so unlike me, but it was one in my entire tenure that I could not stand. And um, that was my last ever meeting. You know, how fantastic. So um, I'll, I'll never forget uh, him. And I left there and I headed off for the mammogram and the ultrasound. And so naive, you know, I go in, I've gone there on my own. Um, I go in for the mammogram first and then for the ultrasound. And then the lady doing the ultrasound, who was lovely, we chatted about puppies and all sorts of different things. Um, she then said to me, oh, we just want to get a different view. So we're just going to do another mammogram. So why don't you head back into that room? I'm still just going you know, that, isn't that lovely? And, you know, off I go in there. And then when I finished that, they said to me, oh, the, um, and I forget the medical names of all these people, but the radiologist uh, would now like to, uh, to do another ultrasound. So come back in. At that stage, I thought, hmm, that's slightly suspicious, isn't it? I wonder if this is all part of the normal process. 
Anyway, I quickly found out it wasn't because he then said to me when he finished, when are you seeing your GP? And I said, oh, I guess when the results are ready, I will, um, I'll contact her and make an appointment. And he said, well, I've just got off the phone from her and she'll see you at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. So if you've ever got any doubt or questions in your mind at that point in time about what they've found, well, that gets rid of those. I remember at the time thinking that guy might have needed a bit more training in how to, how to communicate, but he got his message across and I turned up with my GP the next day. And, you know, I would say that it's the first time in my life that I truly felt vulnerable. Up until that point, I would have said, even I would have been pumped up on my own kind of, you know, I can do anything and, you know, all those sorts of things. And it was the first time that I really felt that way. And, you know, I tried to control the elements I could kind of control of it early on, which was things like, well, I'll cut my own hair short. You know, I had long hair kind of down to here. I'll cut my own hair short. I'll shave my own hair off um, because, you know, your hair falls out pretty bloody quickly when you go into that process. But in I went and in I went to six months of chemo and then I went through um, mastectomy and reconstruction. And I, I will tell you that, you know, every cloud does have a silver lining and I have really lovely perky boobs now. So um, <laughs> not offering to show them, but I really do have lovely perky boobs now. And, um, and that's an absolute, you know, that is a bonus. I would not have been on the beach in a bikini before and I'll do that. So um and then in I went to, to radiation. It's a hell of a way to get a new set. There's other ways if you want them, ladies. So I'll just throw that out there as well. But um, in I went into radiation as well. And, you know, I think I learned some big lessons through here, which was, you know, just surrender. And, and I learned stuff about myself. I always thought I would be the sort of person that would turn up to these medical appointments and, and quiz people around you know well tell me more about this and is that really the best treatment and like, no that's not me at all I was just like you just tell me what I need to do where do I need to show up and I will just get on with this um, and oh my goodness the gratitude you feel for the people who've chosen to work in the healthcare sector oh my goodness um, you know those nurses are there because of the sort of people and personalities they are just absolutely unbelievable anyway Back to my you can do hard shit um, things, you know, you guys can, you, you can probably, if you've got kids yourself, you can put yourself in the shoes of this. But having to tell your kids, um, you know, that sucks. Um, and my son was nine, my daughter was 12. And, you know, those poor little innocent kids, no one wants to, you know, no one wants to go home and have those conversations. Um, but but you can do it and you learn stuff about your kids I mean just gorgeous stuff um, you know in the middle of the night I woke up and I heard my daughter was sobbing and I went in and my son bless him um, you know we lay there and we chatted and we talked and he's nine and he then said how about we all meditate I think to myself has he ever heard anyone in his life meditate and he goes just imagine you're on a beach and it's, you know, all these gorgeous things. And so you do, you just learn stuff that is, is absolutely incredible about your kids. I was never good at asking for help. You know, I, I kind of never really needed to. And, you know, if you're going to learn a lesson around people really love helping other people um, and that it's okay to ask for help, then, you know, again, a hard way to do it. But, you know, you do learn your lesson that way. And stop worrying about what you can't control. You know, and so if I come back again to the we can do hard shit, we can do hard shit, we really can. We're more powerful than we know. And, you know, for me as an example and, and for any of you guys, we have these networks of people that we're connected to. So how do you kind of influence them and what do you take out of every situation you go through? And as I said to you, being 45 and never having had a mammogram before, it wasn't on my radar. Well, you can bet your ass it was on the radar of everyone in my network as I went through this. Um, you know, and I, I was really vocal about it. Go and get a mammogram. You know, I'm posting on every channel known to man pictures of boobs and say, go and get them checked and stuff like that. So um, anyway, that was the kind of second phase. And, 
And then we get to the reinvention phase. And um, I want to make sure we've got good question time. So it's probably Jules, maybe another 10 minutes, if that's okay, in, term, in terms of talking. So um, I probably should have shared at the start that I can't, quite like talking. So. <laughs> um, so I finished all my treatment. It was about 18 months all up. And it was kind of like, where to from here? I just, I knew that I didn't want to go back into executive roles. And I've had people ask me, you know, you love the CEO role so much. Why didn't you go back and all that sort of stuff? It's time for a change. I didn't know what the what was, but I knew that it was time for a change. And I really needed somewhere to point. And so for me, I, I, I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want to travel. And my kids were teenagers or become, you know, they were going to soon become teenagers. And I'd always said to myself, I want to be home when they're teenagers. I don't want to be on airplanes away in hotel rooms and things like that. I might have an ask about, I don't know, but it was kind of like when they don't want me around, I, I want to be there. Um, so it's kind of working out okay for all of us. We're, we're still living under the same roof at this stage. Um, so I thought, what what can I do? And I did what I see a lot of women do. Um, and that is I pointed myself towards board roles. And I kind of thought, well, you've been a CEO, you've done the AICD course, why wouldn't you go in that direction? And, you know, people tell you all sorts of stuff you want to hear, like, oh, wow, you've been a female CEO, people will love that. And, you know, all those sorts of things. And I, I, I do have I've, I've got two board roles now. I had three, but we sold the company. But I quickly kind of found out that it wasn't it just wasn't filling me up, and I needed something more than that. Um, I also took the opportunity. You know, I was very fortunate. I had people ringing me saying, "Could I come and help them out? Could I come and do consulting?" And you know, so I said yes to all of those things that came my way. I said yes. And when I look back on that, you know, really, I think that I said yes from a place of fear, um, you know, a fear of not being relevant anymore. And, you know, so I then found myself at a place in the end of 2019 where I was exhausted, totally exhausted, completely flat and hadn't learned any of the lessons that I needed to learn um, along the way. And, you know, basically I needed to stop. So I'm not here to tell you that I caused the global pandemic. But my decision to slow down and stop timed um, pretty well with what started going on in, in China. So it was really interesting, you know, universes align and all that sort of stuff. I didn't mean I wanted to stop quite as completely as that and as completely as, you know, as everyone has for a period of time. Um, but I did need to stop. And so I was very deliberate about saying, I'm not saying yes to anything for three months. I'm going to give myself this space to, to stop. And I have to say it was the first time in my career really where I stopped. Uh, you know, like so many um, women and like so many leaders, um, I'm very good at doing, I'm very good at getting shit done. Um, you know, very good. I would always tell myself very good at multitasking. Um, you know, give me a deadline. I work best under pressure and all those sorts of things. And I believe that, um, you know, I believed all of that as well. But it's not really true. And so when I stopped, I actually started investing in myself for the first time in a really long time. And, you know, I found yoga as the first kind of little seatbelt. And I see a lot of nodding going on there. And now with what I've learned about, you know, yoga, I get why it worked for me. And I, you know, now I understand that yoga is about balancing masculine and feminine energy. And I had really always operated from a space of masculine energy. In fact, I remember this guy saying to me at one point and kind of thinking it was a compliment. I know he meant it as a compliment, but he said, oh, gosh, I really love working with you. Like you bring a real masculine energy to, you know, and I know that he meant logic and rational and considered and all these sorts of things. But it wasn't until I looked back that I thought it's a really unusual comment to, to make. But I did. I think I did operate from a very um, uh, not male. I don't mean that, but, but a probably masculine sort of energy space. 
hadn't made as much time for, you know, the feminine energy side of things. And when I say feminine energy, I am talking about being and stillness and intuition, um, open to seeing possibilities, not having a path that necessarily goes from A to B, you know, maybe a circular path, not necessarily a kind of straightforward linear path. And so yoga was was pretty important to me at that point in time. And then I started invest, you know, investing in myself from a nutrition point of view, saw a naturopath, got myself kind of, you know, got rid of all the toxic crap that had gone into my body, not just going through chemo, but, you know, probably for years of uh, corporate executive lifestyles before that as well. And in stopping, I think for the first time I listened to myself and I'm a good listener um and um i think it is one of my superpowers but i had always been listening to everyone else and i don't think i had stopped to really listen to me and and kind of work out what this next phase of my journey needed to be about and this is where i kind of talk about the magic of hearing because the the more i stopped the more i slowed down and the more i processed for myself that here i was Um, an ex-CEO, someone who, you know, many people would look at and say ticks all the hallmarks of success traditionally, Um, spoken to thousands, negotiated multi-million dollar contracts, um, led four and a half thousand people successfully, kicked goals in terms of, you know, performance and things like that. And here I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to do next? And how am I going to show up? And who would be interested? And what would I have to say that people would want to know about? Um, And what will people think, you know, when I do kind of show up in this next space? So full of all of this inner critic voice and these self-doubts and things like that. And I thought, it can't just be me. But if I'm feeling this way, like, you know, there must be a lot of people out there who are kind of feeling this way. And so... What I did was I created my own PhD um, and I've stolen that language from someone else recently, but I created my own PhD. And so I went about this interview series that I called Brave Feminine Leadership. And I interviewed uh, all of these incredible leaders and I took the time in those conversations to ask them the stuff I wanted to know about have you got this inner critic voice going on? Do you self-reject from opportunities sometimes? Um, You know, what, and and I also started exploring why, you know, female leaders, um, why they struggle and, you know, a couple of stats to remind anyone if they need it. But, you know, last year, ASX 300, one out of 23 appointments to CEO role was female. You know, that sucks. You know, Australia, on the, we're in 50th place on the World Economic Forum Global Gender Equity Index. We're going backwards. Um, you know, in 2020, we thought it would take 99 years to, work, to reach global gender parity. Um, now we're at 135 years. Um, none of this stuff is, is inspiring stuff and COVID's made it worse. You know, people are females are leaving workplace in droves and as I said to you before I just don't think it needs to be that way I don't I think I think you know we can we can inspire change and we can inspire change sooner so for me um you know I guess I said to you earlier that I've always looked for a seatbelt at every stage of my journey and you know the thing that has been so utterly fascinating to me And I'm in this next phase, you know, I'm reinventing myself and I'm showing up and I'm doing things that feel uncomfortable um, and and just getting on and doing them. But but my seatbelt's me. It's always been me. Um, I didn't need to look externally for, for that kind of security and safety. It's always just been me. That is my story, Jules. So there's more to come, but that's the story so far. Wow. Oh, my God. I got goosebumps when you went on my own seatbelt. I can tell you've done this before. (laughs) Like you're very, very inspiring. Wow. What an amazing story. Now I'm just going to put it back onto the view so I can see everyone else. It's been lovely for me seeing everyone else, all your gorgeous faces. That's good. And I think I will just stop.